Hi, everybody. All right, last section of this week's lecture. Uh, this is part three. So if you haven't watched part one and two yet, you need to go back and do that. I left us off with this image, um, talking a little bit more about Imperial China, um, which had gone out in around uh, the 16th century and built a uh, larger empire uniting uh, different regions of what had formerly been parts of China under a, a single rule. And so um, the Chinese and the Qin were interested in building uh, this, this larger empire by incorporating people um, who they saw as inherently Chinese and sharing a very similar background to their own. And I ask you to think, you know, this is what we're talking about in our primary source discussion this week, but think about the way in which religion factors into these different empires that we're um, talking about. You know, the textbook tells you a little bit about how the Spanish, Catholic Spanish, practiced uh, conversion of indigenous people as a major part of empire building. Um, to a lesser extent, uh, the British are going to do that as well, uh, creating a Protestant empire uh, in the Americas. They weren't as interested in evangelizing to native people as the Spanish, but they definitely do parts of it. Harvard, uh, the university, Harvard College established in um in New England and Boston uh, was originally had a, a very large Indian school that was meant to proselytize to uh, the native people. So you can see it there uh, in the British Empire. And when we shift into uh, Asia, there is a religious component to empire building as well. Uh, the Russians, of course, are going to bring uh, Russian Orthodoxy with them as they move into Siberia. But it's a little bit different in China. Uh, and this, you know, Temple of Heaven that I've got pictured here on the left in our primary source discussion you know, how is this majestic, beautiful kind of empire that's, or um, building that's here a symbol of power? You know, in the same way that middle image is of the Vatican. How are religious symbols used to enforce empire is something you should think about when you're uh, responding to our primary source prompt uh, this week, because uh, religion is a major tool in empire building, and it's used in the Americas, it's used in Asia, and to, to an extent, even though it's not a Christian religion, uh, there is a lot of similarities between this temple of heaven here and something like the Vatican uh, and the religious message that was brought by Christian colonizers to the new world. So think about these connections, right? This is where we can see the major theme uh, for today's class and for this week's lecture is that there are similarities and there are differences and recognizing them uh, is incredibly important. And, you know, what's the big outcome, right? You know, you've got this Russian empire in the north and you've got the Chinese empire that's building down to the south. You can see this map uh, to our left about how a European saw Asia around the 17th uh, and 18th centuries. You'll notice there the big land owned by the Russians, big land owned by the Chinese. You can see India there carved out. Well, ultimately what the creation of these very large, powerful empires did was create stability. Uh, for those of you, any Star Wars fans out there, uh, this is always the argument that, uh, you know, the Empire, the evil Empire in Star Wars argues for. What does the Empire bring? It brings stability, right? It might not bring uh, liberty and freedom and all these other good things, but it brings stability and it can create a tremendous amount of profit uh, and no connection to Star Wars here. But that's exactly what the consolidation of a Chinese Empire is going to help do and a Russian Empire is going to help do in Asia. Bring stability create the ability to trade now with other regions of uh, Europe and of Asia and create kind of economic um, power in these regions. And so the creation of a Chinese and the Russian empire in Asia is going to mean that there are now two central locations uh, of economic and normally economic means military might uh, in Asia. And this brings us into our third part of this lecture. So we've looked at the Atlantic empires. We talked about how shifting power from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic created these new overseas empires for Western European nations. Then we looked at landlocked regions of the east. We saw the Russians spread out not west, but east into Siberia for the same access to resources. We talked a little bit about how the Chinese incorporated people that they saw as inherently Chinese into an empire and the ultimate creation of a more stable uh, economic power in Asia. Now we shift our gears uh, to two other places. We'll talk first about the Indian subcontinent, so uh, creation of the Mughal Empire in India, and then we'll talk about the Ottoman Empire uh, and how it existed in the Middle East and Southeast Asia. And again, we wanna think comparatively, right? The driving question for this third part is how can we compare these empires to their competing Asian empires, but also the Western empires of the Atlantic model. 
So the first group we want to talk about uh, are the Mughals of India. So now, who are the Mughals? It's very important to kind of understanding what happened in India. So the Mughals are descended uh, from a group of people pushed into the Asian steppe. Uh, so this is what is now kind of um, the uh, southwestern region of Asia. People pushed into the, um, the Asian steppe. These are people who had previously uh, conquered large portions of Asia, but are now being pushed out mostly by the expanding Chinese and expanding Russian empire. So they're people who are pushed uh, out by the other empires we've talked about. And they settle for a while in uh, what's now kind of the Afghanistan, uh, Iran region. They convert to Islam, which is the predominant uh, religion of the region. And then they're pushed out of that into northern India. And what they encounter in the Indian subcontinent is a large, um, tremendously wealthy in terms of uh, resources, uh, subcontinent that's home to a diverse group of people who are not united. In India, there were a whole bunch of smaller uh, principalities, kingdoms, but they were much, much smaller and they were diverse and separated uh, in India. And what the Mughals were able to do, and you can see this uh, from the uh, image, is they're able to slowly consolidate power by conquering these different kingdoms until eventually they've conquered pretty much the entire Indian subcontinent, which they hold until 1707, when the British are going to take it over. And we'll talk about that a bit later. But the Mughals, you should recognize, uh, they practice Islam. They are Muslims. Uh, the people who they encounter, these uh, traditional kingdoms of India, are not. They're Hindus, right? Or they practice Zoroastrianism, some of them. Uh, uh, they're diverse groups of people, and much, again, unlike the Spanish or the English or the French, and more similar to what the Chinese are doing, they don't force Islam on all the people of India. In fact, they allow them to continue to practice their traditional Hinduist beliefs. And what this means is that they're able to foster an incredibly vibrant and incredibly diverse um, intellectual atmosphere in the courts of Mughal India. And so unlike what the Spanish are doing, where they subjugate the native people, they enslave them, and then when they start dying off from the great dying, they import uh, African slaves. That's not what's going on in, in either China or in India. Instead, the Mughals, even though they are religiously and racially different from the people that they encounter in India, they're not in, interested in subjugating and exploiting them in the same way uh, that the Spanish or the, the French or the English do uh, in the New World. Quite to the contrary, there is some exploitation involved in here, but so long as the um, people of India pra uh, continued to pay their taxes and continued to be subordinate to Mughal rule, they were kind of allowed to do what they wanted. They were able to maintain uh, their native religion, they were able to maintain their native festivals, and instead what you have is a, is a cultural mixing that's created in uh, the Mughal Empire of India. And this cultural mixing creates a really vibrant um, courtly life that combines the traditions of a lot of uh, different peoples. In fact, a predominant um, language still in India is Urdu, uh, and Urdu is the, is the mixing of uh, traditional Indian languages uh, and uh, the Arabic language, and you create this Urdu, which has elements of, of both languages in there. Uh, and this is one of the major languages that was spoken uh, in the Mughal court. And so there's still really remnants uh, of the Mughal Empire. Like I said, it'll be the British, actually, who will exploit the problem. Um, the problem with Mughal uh, India is that there were some within Mughal India who didn't like this mixing on both ends. There were Hindus who didn't like mixing with uh, the Muslims, and there were Muslims who didn't like mixing uh, with the Hindus. And what the British do when they come to India is they recognize this, and they're able to use the Hindu people of India to drive out the Mughals. They'll side with the British uh, and eventually find out the British didn't have their best interests in mind. But don't worry, we'll get there. That's, that's for another day. And so this really vibrant court of Mughal India is the difference we want to focus on. You know, they practice conquest, right? It's through war that they're able to colonize or, I guess, incorporate much larger portions of India. But unlike what's going on in the New World, they're going to incorporate the native people and really kind of keep a, a culturally diverse court going. Uh, and this creates a, a tremendous, uh, not just economic profits, right? They're able to benefit from control of large resources in the Indian subcontinent, uh, but they're also able to foster a really vibrant education system. 
Um, they're able to incorporate traditional Islamic knowledge with traditional Hindu knowledge uh, and create a very advanced scientific society um, through the incorporation of different ideas. And, you know, the remnants, if you're thinking, okay, well, what, what can I see? You know, what can I see in India of the Mughal Empire? Look at the Taj Mahal, right? Taj Mahal, a very, you can recognize some traditional uh, Islamic architecture there, but it sits in India. You know, this is a vestige of uh, the Mughal rule in India. And so this creates another economic powerhouse uh, in the Asian continent. But you should also notice in the same way that an expanding Chinese dynasty bups, uh, butts up against Russia, an expanding uh, Mughal dynasty in India is going to butt up against China. So you have the creation of these new empires, you have the creation of economic stability, but you also have some growing rivalries. And these rivalries will become important as we kind of play out global history uh, going forward. So let's change our uh, emphasis to one last empire. We've got the Atlantic empires, we've got the growing Russian empire, we've got the Chinese empire, we've got Mughal India. The last one we have to look at is perhaps one of the largest and most powerful at the time. Uh, and this is the Ottoman Empire. Really, if we're going to tell the story of world history from about the year 1500 to 1700, we should have started with the Ottoman Empire, right? It's the Ottoman capture of Constantinople, modern day Istanbul, in uh, 1453, that's a turning point that shifts power from the Mediterranean uh, to the Atlantic in Europe. Um, but the Ottoman Empire was, um, by the 17th century, really beginning to slow down in its territorial advance. As you'll see here, uh, the modern uh, Ottoman Empire was massive, right? It was centered in what's today Turkey, Anatolian Peninsula, uh, there in uh, Asia Minor, uh, and it had conquered large portions of the Middle East, uh, all the way out uh, to the Iranian, what's mo today modern Iran. They'd conquered all of Egypt. Large portions of northern Africa were also their tributaries, meaning that they weren't necessarily ruled by the Ottomans, but they paid the Ottom Ottomans a tremendous amount of money to kind of uh, keep uh, stability in the region. But perhaps most importantly, they hadn't just conquered Constantinople, they had pushed up north and west into Europe. Uh, and in the 17th century, they're just outside the gates of Vienna. Uh, you know, the major heart into Eastern Europe, uh, the Ottomans were threatening to push up into Vienna and perhaps could have even conquered uh, large portions of Europe. Uh, they are defeated, however. The Ottomans will be defeated outside Vienna. They're also going to lose a major naval battle, the Battle of Lepanto uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. And so this will push them back. The Ottomans will never conquer Europe like so many European nations were afraid of. Um, but they do threaten it for a long time. And there's so much power located here in the Middle East because the Ottomans, like the Mughals, had conquered a lot of diverse groups of people and incorporated them in almost seamlessly. Um, these were also uh, Muslims. These were also people who practiced the Islamic faith. However, uh, they were not enforcers of a strict Islamic code in all of the regions that they conquer. Now, they do incorporate large portions of people in the Balkans. So this is what's now uh, Southeastern Asia into uh, the Islamic faith, but as, so long as, again, taxes and tributes are being paid and there's not major uprisings, the Ottomans were pretty generous rulers, creating a diverse group of Christians, Jews, uh, and Islamic thinkers into creating a, a very, um, again, intellectual and academic empire uh, that exists in the Middle East. This is kind of where the really scientific knowledge, up until the scientific revolution of the 17th and 18th century, scientific knowledge is really located not in not at places like Cambridge or in Paris. Instead, it's located in, in the Middle East. It's located in the minds of, of Ottoman thinkers. And it's largely through an intellectual uh, cooperation of Christians, uh, Muslims, and Jews that happens in the Ottoman Empire that creates um, this vibrant Ottoman uh, court system and educational system. So, you know, again, where do we see this? Uh, if you travel today through the Balkans, so this is through southeastern Europe, uh, places like Bulgaria, uh, even parts of Hungary, right, Bosnia, uh, Sarajevo. If you travel to these different places, you'll notice um, some very traditional Islamic architecture, and you'll notice large portions uh, of the population who practice Islam. These are vestiges of the Ottoman Empire. So where does that bring us, right? Take a look at these maps to summarize. The, through, the 17th, uh, through the 1700s, you have the creation of global empires. Right? These empires have a lot of similarities, but they also have a lot of differences. Understanding these empires is going to be key to recognizing how these people are going to interact going forward, how empires 
conflict with each other and how other empires cooperate. So if you have questions, please email me. We can discuss more. I can record more lectures. Uh, if not, I look forward to discussing your posts and giving you some feedback on the response.